Okay, I'm recording. Okay, we're going to do the opening brochas, guys. I'm just uh, putting on the time o'clock here so that we don't run over time whatsoever. And what I was going to ask you is uh, I want you to have the Kavon in mind. I'm just actually also putting my phone on airplane mode so we don't get disturbed. I put my other phone off. And we start the clock now. All right. Baruch Ata Adonai Elohim Melacholam. Amen. <laughs> Okay, guys, the first thing I want to do is just share my screen a second. Okay. I'm going to share it just for a sec. Okay. Now, I don't know if you can see what I'm seeing. Um, Arthur, no. Arthur, Arthur's brother-in-law passed away. His name was Michael Gordon. It, uh, his wife, Nadine, it was her brother. And he ran the Comrade Marathon in 2007. Yeah, and uh, he passed away today on the 1st of Tammuz. His name was Michal Ben Gedaliahu. And we're learning in the commemoration of his Nashoma, so that his Nashoma has an Aliyah. Um, and uh, Arthur, I don't know if you want to say anything about your brother in law, or I can't see you even. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. I don't know if you want to say anything or... Uh... Yeah, just, you know, uh, for, I mean, I, I knew Michael since we were like both almost the same age. We just, we were literally almost a couple of months apart. Um, I mean, I knew him since, well, when Nadine was four, he was eight. Okay. And that's when I met them when I was also eight years old. And I knew him all my life. Uh, you know, he was a fantastic father. I mean, he, he, his kids and his family loved him. I mean, Lisa uh, and him dated for years, and they finally got together. They got married. They had uh, two wonderful kids. Um, and it was just such a tragic thing. It was, um, you know, I, got, I, I suddenly got a call to say, get home quick. Uh, Michael passed away. I couldn't believe it. They told me on the comrades. They died in the comrades. I had to get home, go to my wife keep the secret from her until the sister came to tell her because obviously I wanted you know to come from the sister not from me um it was just, it was just very heartbreaking he was so young 34 years old I mean yeah, literally yeah. as he came into the what's the name into the comrades the last the last uh, kilometer of the race he collapsed the guy four guys dragged him over the line thinking he was well I think it's four guys or two guys they dragged him over they put him down and he was really dead by that stage so it was really too late, but it was just it was just such a sad, a sad ending, you know, to such a great guy. Well, Arthur, I hope this learning is an elevation for and an aliyah for his neshama, and just send your wife uh, and uh, Nadine and Peter uh, my condolences and um, just uh, thanks, Arthur, for this opportunity. I appreciate it very much. Amen. And as well, I used to dive Waverly Shore. Him and Lisa used to go there. So yeah. Um, all right, guys, let's get started. Now, the learning that we ended off on, um, we ended off on 9A2 yesterday. Okay? And we were just talking about the case of being able to pay with uh, money versus property. In other words, uh, when you pay with money, when you pay with property, do you pay with both? Can you pay the best of your brand, etc.? And what happened is uh, Rav Huna said that uh, money is equivalent to land. And what does this mean? It means you could pay with either money or land with regards to damages. And um, it seems to indicate that Rav Asi has got an independent ruling, but yet his ruling is the same of Rav Huna. So we want to see where his ruling is a little bit different. And in fact, if it is uh, different. And this is in 9A2. So I'm just, uh, I'm just going to propose Rav Asi's uh, case of what he's talking about, of a case where you can pay either with land or, or with money. 
and that they both have proof. Remember, we, we're having evidence as to the fact of trying to reconcile Pitt where he said, we shall return money, and uh, versus the Shane and Regal where he says, he must pay with the choices of his land. Obviously, in both cases, you must. Okay. So this is where the discussion is coming from. So we're going to unroll Rav Asi's uh, uh, discussion, and he's referring to a case here of two brothers who divide an estate. And one is taking land as a share, and the other is taking money. And the credit of the father came forward and took the land from the first brother as payment for the debt. And the explanation, according to Rav Asi, is that the first brother must go and take half the share of money along with the second brother. Now, the Gomorrah says this is an untenable explanation. When I say the word untenable, I don't uh, think in modern terms that it is the best explanation of the word with modern language. So what I'm going to say to you is as follows, is that why are we saying it's not, a necess it's not necessary to say this, according to Rav Asi? Guys, do you have any sort of suggestion or can I go on? Whatever you suggest. Go on. Go on. So what we're go saying go is, what's the point of Rav Asi saying this? This is, seems obvious. In other words, the father was deceased and uh, basically he left his children land. And then there was a creditor of the late father and he went to go and collect land that belonged to one particular brother in lieu of payment for his damages or his loan that was owed, whatever the case may be. And then the first brother can go to the second brother and uh, uh, take half the share of the second brother. So while this says it's an untenable explanation, when the Gomorrah uses the word untenable, it means it's obvious. Because why would you have to have Rav Asi bring this law? Because if the, is the first brother and the second brother both not children of the father, why should the first brother, a son, and the second brother, this son, not share in the obligation and responsibility of the debt? So it seems obvious that one brother must reimburse the other for credit to tax one brother's share. So it says this cannot be the correct interpretation of Rav uh, Asi's ruling. So what it's saying here is it's not that it's not obvious or logical. It's because there seems to be a bit of a flaw here. And we're going to explore one or two things. But it's not from lack of logic. And firstly, the one example is that why state the obvious? Because if they're both children, what would happen according to Rav's opinion? Because Rav Asi, there's two opinions. There's the opinion of Shmuel and Rav. So the opinion of Rav here is that if one of the uh, if the children inherit land, and one of those lands is taken, the children then redivide uh, the land. In other words, say um, say you've got different pockets of land, then that is taken out of the equation, and then the land is reassessed from the uh, land that was subtracted due to paying back a loan, and then it's redivided amongst the brother, the two brothers. Does that make sense, guys? That would yes. be, that's according to Rav. It's pretty straightforward. So Rav sees it as a case that once the property is taken, it's as though it was taken before the state was uh, divided. So whether it was before or after, it's no reason why one brother should be held with um, the loss. Because would the father not like both his children to have the uh, equal the land equally? So it would seem obvious. So why is Rav Atsi's case mentioned here? Now, what you'll remember is, I don't know if you remember on 8B, on note 2. Firstly, do you remember when we discussed the previous case where we said that a debtor could uh, not take uh, the land... Um, that were heirs if they were from orphans. Do you remember this? Yes. I yeah. Do. Okay. So I just want to note you, read you the note of 8B3 because it seems like a contradiction here. So there's two possible explanations for the contradiction. The one possible uh, explanation uh, is, is what? Is the fact that, um, in fact, these brothers were not orphans. That's number one. Does that make sense? in that they still had their mother. So they weren't technically orphans. So they don't fit in the definition as that you can't collect the debt from orphans because these brothers were not orphans. So that's one opinion. Then there's an, another alternative opinion. 
What's the other alternative opinion? Is that in fact, um, after a certain age, you're not necessarily considered an orphan. So you might be considered an orphan when you're a katana. In other words, uh, under bar mitzvah age, because you still need to be looked after. And therefore, this, uh, this uh, base in protects you. Do you get what I'm saying? So that's the yeah. second opinion is that these children were fully grown up and independent. And in other words, not subject to that orphan protection law that debtors can't collect, um, sorry, that creditors can't collect from the late father's estate. Then there's a third principle where the debts of a deceased man are not collect from children's movable property or from their privately acquired land. What's privately acquired land? So these now are that the, the family has land, but it doesn't belong in the father's name. It belongs in the, in the children's name, and these children are actually grown up. They still happen to be the man's children, even if they're adults in their own right, and that they've got their own land now, and that the father's debts have nothing to do with the children of the children's privately owned land, and um, are not collectible from the father's movable property, only from land inherited by them from the deceased. So according to this opinion, it's a case in, in HB1 where the father in fact left them, um, what do you call it, either movable assets or he sold his field in order to convert it to cash, to pay. Does that make sense? To protect the children against this sort of thing. Okay. So now that we've digressed, I just wanted to explain to you what all those opinions are. We're not sidetracking here. It's just that might have, uh, you might have been confused unless I cleared this up. So the Gemara says, uh, the reason it, uh, it rejects the interpretation of the two brothers sharing is not because it is obvious, because it is, but rather because it's incorrect. Because according, accordingly, there, there's an opinion that says, uh, that the opposite could be true. So what's the opposite? The opposite could be that the second brother may tell the first one, it's this reason, it was with this understanding that I took money as my share. Because if somebody had stolen from me, you can't expect me, if I had a house robbery and somebody took the cash, uh, I can't expect you to pay me back on the cash if I had a house robbery. So why do you expect if your land was collected that I must pay you back. We both took our chances. You had this understanding that your land could be taken, and I had this understanding that my money could be stolen. So we we basically uh, exonerate each other, and I'm not responsible to pay back your debts, and you're not responsible to pay back my debts, because the land, in fact, has now been allocated. Okay. So the Gomorrah said, although this is a counter-argument, uh, it's just factually inc incorrect, and we're going to see why uh, now. One of the fa one of the arguments that I can see with this against the brother that I say I was the first brother. Guys, the Gemara is not saying this. This is what I'm saying. I could turn around to my second brother and say to him, "Listen, it's not that, for example, I was irresponsible or I lost the money or land in a debt. In other words, say our father had le uh, say our our parent had left." an estate to uh, 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 my brother and myself, etc. I'm just giving you an example. Please go at 120 or whatever. And, and, and we had this particular discussion. I would turn around and say to what? I would say, listen, it's not the same as your money being stolen in your house of your share of the money that you got in the estate or somebody robbed your bank account. This has to do with the fact that dad owed a debt. And because dad owed a debt, and that person went to collect from dad's estate. The estate should have paid it. The fact of it is once the land was distributed, there was a property lien on my particular tract of land, but dad would have wanted us both to have equal land. So therefore it's not fair that you wash your hands and say it was as if I had a robbery because this wasn't a debt incurred to me by me. It was incurred by the deceased estate from, um, from a parent. Does that make sense? how the first brother could argue to the opposite. Yes. Now, guys, this it is not the Morris explanation. It would be my argument to the second brother. I could turn around and say, listen, if I had a gambling debt and afterwards I lost my land that I inherited from Pops, that's my problem. I'm not expecting to buy you out. Just like if you had 
your money stolen in your house or your backyard. That's your problem. But this was not my fault. This was a debt that was incurred by the estate from uh, the late parent. So therefore, this is a legitimate argument, in my opinion. And that's why they say that this is incorrect. Okay. So what we're going to do is, so according, according to Shmuel, who holds this opinion um, of, of the one brother not being responsible for the other, we're going to discuss this now. Um, we're going to see what it is. So in other words, there's a risk taken, either money or land as one share. Money can be stolen while land cannot, and land can be collected by the father's creditor while money cannot. According to this version, the Gomorrah's rebuttal of the brother who took the money can claim that each brother took his share with the unspoken understanding that he accepted the risk inherent in the type of inheritance he chooses, and the brother who took the money is therefore not required to reimburse his sibling for the land that was collected from him. But the commentators say that uh, even though this is the opposition argument, it's just uh, simply not true. It's incorrect. All right, so we're going to see and try and get a bit more clarity. So the Gomorrah then considers another popular uh, possibility. So Rav Asi refers to a case where two brothers divide an estate, each taking a portion of land as his share, and the creditor of the father came and took the share of one of them as payment for his debt. Rav Asi rules that the second brother might reimburse the first brother with either land or money. So let's just see here, why, why was this Gomorrah brought in? It's because we said we need a proof from Rav Asi that land is equal to money. Are you with me in terms of repaying back the debt? So Rav Asi says that when the second brother pays back the, the first brother, that he can pay in either land or money. So they redivide the estate. In other words, the land's been confiscated and then they, they redivide it as though that debt was taken from the estate and not uh, taken from the first brother because it wasn't, it wasn't, um, it wasn't the brother's debt. It was the father's debt. And the father would generally like both his children to have. Now, why did he take from the one brother and not the other? Because we're holding up the opinion that there might have been a lien on that particular property and not that grade of land, for whatever reason, for whatever reason. Or alternatively, that there was a lien on that one brother's grade of land and the other brother inherited a different grade of land, whatever the reason. So... What, what Rav Asi is saying is different to Rav. Rav is saying that uh, he's not of the opinion of Shmuel that the one brother doesn't compensate the other. Rav is turning around. This is not Rav Asi. This is Rav. And saying that um, what happens is that when the first brother loses his share to a credit of the father, the second brother gives him half of his land. So it's if the land gets redivided all over again, but the one brother can only pay the other brother back in land. Rav Asi is saying it's not the case. You can either choose to pay him back in land or money. Does that make yeah. sense? Now, there's one yeah. other rule that Rav Asi has. And Rav Asi has a rule of saying that you only pay back one quarter of the land and not half, half the land. Because Rav Asi doesn't know if Shmuel is right or Rav is right. Shmuel says you don't know anything, the one brother to another. We're going to see why. And uh, Rav says that the, the one brother indeed does a half his share to the other because it was the father's debt. It's not the one brother's fault. They need to re, um, redivide the estate. So Rav Asi is saying he doesn't know which one is correct. So therefore he's making a compromise of you paying a quarter. And you can either pay a quarter with money or you can pay a quarter with land. All right. So let me just read on. Ravasi stated the ruling once before, because it was stated in the case of brothers that divide an estate, and the creditor of the father came forward and took the share of one of them as payment for his debt. There's a dispute regarding what course of action would follow when the brother lost his share, seeks to recover it from his brother. The original division is void, according to Rav, and the remaining estate is divided between the brothers. Shmuel, however, said, he, the brother whose share was taken, has forgotten his inheritance and has no claim against the other brother. Rav Asi said he takes one quarter of his brother's land in compensation, or the brother may give him the equivalent of one quarter of his field in money. So the Gomorrah is about to explain the reason of Rav and Shmuel, but we see Rav Asi takes the middle ground. He's not sure. And it's at this point where he says you can either take your quarter share in money or in land. Rav says purely 
that the compensation must be in land because they then redivide the land in essence. Does that make sense? So, uh, so you take the midway position. Okay. Um, right. Let me, we on 9A3 now? All right. And because he is of the opinion that the brothers who divide an inheritance are considered heirs with respect to their shares. Okay. So Ralph believes that they're heirs. And what do heirs do when the estate takes something? Even if the estate has already paid it out and the creditor comes afterwards, the estate is redivided equally amongst the brothers. So he see, Ralph sees them again as heirs. And what, how does Shmuel see them? Shmuel has seen them as purchasers of their respective shares because they exchange their true shares for the ones they actually receive. In other words, what does he mean their true shares for the one they actually receive? The father's wishes then come into actual uh, property received. And at that point, they have, uh, they've actually got tangible re responsibilities once it gets into their hands. And if money is stolen and if land is confiscated, it's not their particular uh, problem of the estate. Does this make sense? So the dispute is not if there's a creditor before the estate is divided. But Shmuel and Rav say before it's divided officially, then you just re-divide. But they're both talking about a case of after the fact, after the estate was divided. Um, Rav still says it gets re-divided. Shmuel said it's like a purchaser without a guarantee meaning that the one brother has no claim against the other brother. Okay? And Rav Asi says he's not sure, and therefore he's going to make a compromise that instead of them just resplitting it half-half, that the uh, dispossessed brother gets a quarter of the share from the other brother in money or land. Okay. So I'm just going to explain the definitions here. So when a person dies, each of the heirs is considered to have received a definite share of the estate. However, at the time, there's no clear way to determine which assets have been inherited by which heir. So the disagreement between Rav and Shmuel concerns the relationship of the heirs to the respective shares after the estate has been divided between them. Rav is of the opinion that we apply the principle of Barera, which is retroactive designation, mean we say, listen, this came to life before, but what? It's actually the death of the father. It's not like the one brother was being irresponsible. So then retroactively, we redesignate the land and redivide the estate, whether it was before or afterwards. It doesn't matter. Before the people got, uh, the brothers got their land. So to establish at the end of the day, each receives the very portion that the father wished uh, at the time of his death that his son would have. And generally, unless there's a rift in the family, he would want both his sons to have. Now, uh, so, the, okay, so since the allocation of the shares merely determines which share each receives from the father, the status as heirs remains unaffected by the division. Thus, they and the shares they took remain equally responsible to pay off the debts against the estate, even after it had been divided. Therefore, when a creditor takes one brother's share in collection of a debt, it shows, in fact, that the brother never received his proper share. And therefore, a new division must be made. The situation is no different than had the creditor come and taken the field before the estate had been divided, in which case it is obvious that the brothers would have divided the remainder of the estate and each would have received half of it. Um, so Shmuel is of the opinion that we can't apply this principle of Barreira, which means retroactive uh, re uh, re uh, allotment of inheritance. Okay. Uh, because it remains forever uncertain which share originally came to which brother. So how Shmuel says it is that if the father wanted each brother to have two different pockets of land, then that was the father's intention. So therefore, they, in fact, are like buyers without a guarantee. And in essence, uh, when the brothers divide their state, each brother, in effect, agrees to feed the rights he may have in the portion of the other brother in return for the brother's agreement to do the same. Um, and vice versa, the other brother uh, agrees to uh, cede his rights to the other brother's property. Therefore, when a creditor takes one brother's share, it's the same as if the brother had bought a field from someone and then uh, collected by a creditor of the seller. That's according to the rush bump. Okay, so why does he say this? Because there's a general rule. When one purchases real property, it's understood that the seller guarantees to reimburse the buyer. Why? Because 
even if the guarantee wasn't written into a bill of sale, a buyer is not going to be stupid. He's not going to spend his money recklessly and would only agree to buy a field with a guarantee. But this is something that he inherited. It has nothing to do, even, even though it becomes his property as though he purchased it, with the fact that he can control the guarantee because he never chose to purchase this land. It was given to him. And since it was given to him, it's the equivalent of a purchase or a great windfall that happened, but it's without a guarantee. And it's not fair that he obligates his brother. Okay, so Rav Asi wasn't sure to, whether to apply the principle of Barrera. This is in Getim 25a. Uh, and then he said two different things to Rav. He said, we'll have a difference between Shmuel and Rav in that... Um, Basically, you only have to pay instead of half your estate, the second brother to the first, one quarter. And Ralph said you can only pay back in land because in essence, what happens is the land gets redivided. But Ralph Asi is actually saying you can pay back in land or money. Okay. So, and there is another opinion that says you must pay back in land and money, meaning that your quarter, you pay back in land and you pay some of it back in money. So, what what this has come to prove, we've come full circle, is that actually Rav Asi agrees with Rav Huna. The only thing this Gomorrah is doing is bringing a case of proving Rav Asi agrees to Rav Huna. So it says, let's amend it and say uh, it's the same. In other, in, other, in other words, they're of the exact same opinion. Guys, how much time do we have left? Uh, seven minutes. Fine. All right, I just want to go to a new topic. We've got a few minutes. So Rav Zaira said in the name of Rav Huna, because now it's talking about other cases Rav Huna said. For a mitzvah, one spends up to a third. So the Gemara examines this enigmatic statement. What's the nature of the third? What is the third of? So guys, if you're wondering why this is talked about, we want to bring another case um, of how great Rav Huna is that many people, great people, uh, quote Rav Huna, even Rav Asi. So Rav Zaira says of Rav Huna, for a mitzvah, one spends up to a third. So we don't know what this means is up to a third. Do you, do you spend up to a third of what is your belongings? Meaning, if you uh, do you give a third of your estate? In other words, is your tzedakah portion 33%? But then it says, do you spend this on each mitzvah? In other words, if you've got three mitzvahs coming your way, and it's talking about mitzvahs like buying a Torah scroll or buying a lulav. Remember in, in those days to buy a lulav, only one town had a lulav because uh, in the middle of Eastern Europe, you had to get it all the way from Morocco. You had logistical issues, etc. So they're talking about expensive mitzvah. And they said something's wrong here because it can't be that you have to spend one third of your estate because if you do three mitzvahs, You've gone broke. And who's going to look after you? So it says, if you sound to save in a third of the estate, but then if three mitzvahs happen to come his way at the same time, he would be required to give away his entire estate. So obviously, that interpretation of Rav Huna is untenable. So the Gemara offers another interpretation. Rav Zairus said, Rav Huna means that for the beautification of a mitzvah, one must spend up to a third of the sum on the mitzvah itself. So what does that mean? In other words, um, Gavin and I went to buy Lulav in Etrog once and I wanted to at least once in my life buy the Mahuda Mahuda and the best of the best for Lulav in Etrog and I uh, they were selling at 600 Rand and then the most expensive one was 900 Rand and you can spend up to a third extra for the Mahuda of a Mitzvah and it seems that it's limited to a third I think maybe as a safety precaution so in terms of tefillin, you get different grades of tefillin. So the Mitzvah wants to, uh, the Gemara wants to say, what is this third? Rav Ashi asks, because Rav Ashi also learns from Rav Huna, what is the third? Is it reckoned from the inside or was it reckoned from the outside? Do you know what the word inside and outside means, guys? Or not, when we're no. calculating a third. Before we get that, let's get to one mathematical principle. Arthur, how long do we have left? Because we've got five lines and then we're done. If we're not done, I don't know what we're going to do. We need five lines. That's all we need. But I'm going to okay, do this as minutes. quickly as possible. Okay. So firstly, before this, when it was talking about the estate of the expenditure of three mitzvahs, we're not talking about a case where it would deplete all one's assets. So we're not saying you spend 
one third of your estate on each mitzvah, it was saying that you spend one third of your estate and then a third of that and a third of that and a third of that. So let me just explain to you what it means. So if somebody had 27 zoos in their estate, right? Um, if a person had 27 zoos, he would spend nine zoos on the first mitzvah. Okay, because that's a third of your estate, right? Nine zoos. And then how much would you be left with, guys? 18. 27 take away nine? 18. 18. 18. So you're left with 18 zoos. So, so in that case, then if you're left with 18 zoos, you divide it again by three because you're spending one third. So the second mitzvah, you're spending six zoos. And then you've got how many left, guys? 12. 12. Fine. Then you're dividing that and only spending a third. And then on the four. third mitzvah, what have you got left? You've got four. Eight. You've eight. got eight left. You, sorry, eight. You've, you've got eight, you've got eight left. So eight is actually approximately 35% left of the original asset. Because in other words, on the last remaining 12 zoos, um, on the on the yeah, you've 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 got you've got to uh, You've only had to spend one third of that. So 12 take away a third of that, which would be four, leaves you with eight. So you're not actually spending as high as you thought. You've got about 35% left of your estate. Do you get what I'm saying? It's not like you've depleted all of your estate on three mitzvahs. But then the Gemara turns around and says, listen, you don't have to give every of your estate. You actually only have to give a third extra to beautify the mitzvah. So we're gonna discuss inside and outside. So what is inside and outside? So inside means um, that if a mitzvah costs six zoos, okay, and one third of six is what, guys? Two, two zoos. So you only have to add two zoos to the six zoos to spend eight zoos. Does that make sense? Yeah. Guys, yeah. I've lost you. All right. So, no, yeah. so the normal mitzvah is six zoos. So what you have to do, if it says you take the third from the inside, it means you take one third of the six, which is two zoos, and add it to the six zoos, which means you're only yeah. spending eight zoos to beautify the mitzvah. It's one third of the six. When you calculate the third from the outside, it means you take the six divided by two, which is three zoos, times it by three, which is nine zoos. Now, if you have a look at nine zoos, two thirds of nine zoos is six zoos. So you're spending a third extra. You're spending a, a, a third of the nine extra, which comes to six. So that's what it means, the calculation from the outside. Does that make okay. sense? Yeah, it does. Marco? Yeah. Explain it to me. Guys? Okay, so I, I can explain to you quickly, Dames. Okay. The, the, the in comes from the six, which means it's two to a third of... The six it becomes eight, and the outside right. uh, is going to be nine, okay, uh, meaning that it's actually three extra. Yes, so in other words, it's taking from the total amount, or it's taking from the current amount, meaning it's, okay. a, it's you're adding a third or half to the principal. In other words, do you take the nine and say that I only spent an extra third uh, on the mitzvah because the actual item only costs six? So therefore, I'm only spending an extra third to beautify. So you take the total figure. Or do you take okay. the original figure and only take a third of that? That's what it means in or out. 